As Long as the Rivers Flow by Larry Loy. In 1944, Larry Loy, who was then known as Lawrence, was 10 years old and living with his family near Slave Lake in Northern Alberta, Canada. This is his story. Chapter one, Uhu means owl. The baby owl blinked its round yellow eyes at Lawrence and the boy blinked back. Peering out from Papa's knapsack, the owlet was a fuzzy brown and white bundle. When it saw the people, it let out a demanding cheep and loudly clacked its beak. The children jumped back, then laughed. Little sister grabbed at the fluffy feathers. Papa spoke sternly, be careful, Maruk. This owl is just a baby, but it is very hungry and its beak is already sharp. Maruk quickly pulled her hand away. Papa continued, when I was out checking my trap line, I found this bird at the bottom of the tree. There were no other owls around, so I picked it up and brought it home. It is a wild thing, but it needs us now. Otherwise, it will die of hunger or be eaten by a coyote. You children must take care for it. Don't give it butter and jam. Feed it wild meat until it's big enough to return to the forest. We can keep it in the shed, Lawrence said. It's always dark in there. Papa nodded at his eldest son. Lawrence was small for a 10-year-old boy, but he was already wise in the ways of their people. I'll fix a place for it to roost, Papa said. Carefully, he carried the owl to the shed. The children crowded around him. It can sleep in my old dolly's bed and use the blanket, said Maruk. That's a good idea too, Papa smiled. Now, my children, you must give it a name. Is it a boy or a girl owl? Asked little, bro asked little brother Buddy. I can't tell for sure, Papa said. I think it's a boy. They all fell silent, thinking of a good name. Let's call him Minos, shouted baby brother Leonard. Minos meant cat, everyone laughed. Let's call him Uhu, Lawrence said. Uhu means owl in our language, said Papa. That makes it a good name. Every day, the children took Uhu pieces of uncooked rabbit meat to eat. They cleaned the shed and filled the water dish. They chased the dog away when he got too close. After supper, every night, Lawrence put out Papa's old moose hide gloves and went out to the shed. At the sight of him, Uhu raised his voice and clacked his beak. He seemed to know it was time to play. One night, Lawrence carried Uhu to Mama's clothesline with the other children following behind. Sitting by the fire, Grandma and Grandpa watched the parade pass by. Grandma said to Grandpa, Musum, that owl is getting bigger every day. I wonder if you will ever leave the children, Grandpa replied. At the clothesline, Uhu gripped the rope with long feather covered claws. He flapped his wings as if to say, look at me, I'm big now too. In a flash, the little owl was hanging upside down from the clothesline, his wings still flapping. The children jumped up and down with joy, Uhu never tired of playing this game. He needed the exercise to strengthen his wings. When Lawrence put him on the ground, Uhu's ears feathers stood up. Lawrence knew he was angry. Grandpa walked over. Uhu wants to play some more. Toss your owl up into the air and see what happens. He might fall and hurt himself, Lawrence said doubtfully. Try it. He has been exercising those wings a long time. Lawrence picked Uhu off the ground. Hesitating, he looked down at the owl in his arms. He swung his arms upward and tossed Uhu as high as he could. Uhu looked surprised to find himself in the air. He flapped his wings furiously. For an instant, he stayed aloft, then slowly he fluttered to earth. He's flying down instead of up, little buddy squealed. Maruk stroked the owl on his head. Poor little Uhu, you don't have a mama and a papa to teach you how to fly. All afternoon, Mama smoked a moose hide over the smoke pit. Now she took it down from the smoke rack and gave it to Grandma. Kukum, here is more hide for those winter clothes you want to make, she said. Lawrence sat and watched his grandmother sewing winter moccasins. The needle in her small hands went smoothly in and out. Papa and Grandpa were at the barn working on the wagon. They checked the wheels carefully, putting grease on the axles. Uncle Louie oiled the buckles on the horse's harnesses. Lunch is ready, Mama called. Inside their log house, they ate moose stew and fresh bread. Grandpa sipped his tea. We will soon leave for our summer camp near the river, he said. The wagon is ready for travel. I want to take some vegetables on this trip, said Mama, and Kukum has canvas tarps for drying berries. Do we take our tent, asked Lawrence. 
Not this time, Papa replied. The weather is hot and dry. We can make a lean-to for sleeping. The younger children ran outside to play. Lawrence stayed with the older people, listening carefully. Mama spoke quietly. Kukum keeps hearing that children are being taken away from their families and put in schools far away. She looked at Lawrence, then lowered her voice even more. He could only hear part of what she was saying. It was something about prison. What are they going to do to us next, Grandma said. Lawrence didn't understand. What was this school? He didn't want to leave home. He played with the other children all day. He was learning to hunt and fish to help feed the family, and he was pretty good at it too. That night, he lay in bed. He remembered Mama's words. What did they mean? The sun was rising as Lawrence slipped out of bed. As always, Grandma and Grandpa were already awake. Why are you up so early, Grandma asked. I'm going fishing, Kukum. Lawrence took some hooks and a fishing line. At the creek, he would cut a fishing pole with his pocket knife. He also took a small frying pan and a piece of bannock. As he walked along the forest path, he heard a squirrel chatter. To Lawrence, she was saying, get out of my way, I'm gathering nuts for winter. An eagle swooped overhead looking for breakfast. You leave my owl alone, said Lawrence. He smelled wild mint in the air. He would pick some for his mama on his way home. Lawrence came across some bear tracks. His grandpa had told him that grizzly bear claw, make, claw marks were deeper and wider than black bear's marks. The tracks Lawrence had found had been made by a black bear, but they were old and dried out. At the creek, Lawrence caught enough fish to feed the family that day. As he ate his breakfast of fried fish and bannock, he thought of Uncle Louie. Everyone said Uncle Louie was the best tracker and hunter they knew. Already his uncle had taught him a lot. Once when they were out in the bush, Uncle Louie had pointed to some half-chewed leaves. Look at this, he had said. A moose was here less than an hour ago. I want to know as much as Uncle Louis, Lawrence said to himself as he walked home carrying his heavy catch of fish. Chapter 2, The Summer Camp Before leaving their camp, the family laid all their supplies on the ground to see where, where, whether anything had been forgotten. There were pots and pans for cookings and pails for water and berries. A large axe and a small hatchet lay nearby. The sacks would be used to carry dried berries and dried meat. Warm wool blankets were wrapped in a tarp to keep them dry. Let's get the rest of last summer's vegetables out of the root cellar, said Mama. Lawrence followed her under the house. It was cool down there and that kept the vegetables fresh. He held open a sack. Mama put in turnips, onions, and potatoes from her garden. Lawrence carried them up for her. Now we're ready, Mama said. Uncle Lewis hitched the team of horses to the wagon and drove them to, drove them to the supplies. Whoa, Blackie and Nellie, he commanded in a loud voice. Mama surprised the loading of the wagon. Oops, supervised the loading of the wagon. Let's put the grub box someplace handy so we don't have to dig for it when we get hungry, she said to Papa. Soon everything was neatly loaded for the two week stay in the bush. The little ones were crying because they wanted to go too. Lawrence told Maruk, you have to stay with Auntie Jenny and look after Uhu. Don't forget to feed him every day. You know how hungry he gets. I know that already, Maruk said in a huff. Grandma and Grandpa sat on the front seat of the wagon with Mama. Grandpa took the reins. Papa and Uncle Louis set out ahead on foot to clear the trail of any trees or branches that might have been blown down by the wind. Lawrence slipped into the shed to say goodbye to Uhu. I wish you were coming, he said. The camp road was narrow. Trees crowded in on both sides, sometimes forming a canopy above their heads. A few hours down the trail, Grandpa stopped to rest the horses. Another wagon pulled up. Auntie Rose, Uncle James, and cousins Clara, Leo, William, and Sammy had arrived. Sammy, the youngest, was Lawrence's age. The children walked behind the wagon telling stories and jokes. They laughed and teased one another. A couple of dogs walked with them. I hear you have an owl, said Sammy. He pointed to a shaggy dog with one ear longer than the other. My dog can do tricks. He can roll over. He barks when I tell him to speak, he boasted. My owl is very smart, Lawrence said. He flies upside down on the clothesline. He's tough too. He eats raw rabbit. But you can't keep him, said Sammy. You're just jealous, Lawrence blurted out. He is ours anyway until he flies away. Uhu will always remember us. He gave Sammy a shove and walked away. Every year, the family's camp at the same spot beside the wide river. 
When they arrived, Uncle Lewis told the children, give the horses a good rub down, then water them. When you finish, go in the bush and haul wood for the fires, then you can go swimming. Lawrence and Sammy led the horses close to two tree stumps. They stood on the stumps to rub, the brush, rub and brush the horses' backs. Clara, William, and Leo looked for wood. After their chores were done, they raced each other to the river. They had a great water fight. They lay in the sun to dry. As each family set up a lean-to for sleeping, Grandma and Grandpa gathered spruce boughs for the beds. They laid canvas tarps and blankets over the boughs. Spruce boughs keep the frogs and mice out, said Grandma. They don't like the prickly needles. Lawrence found it hard to sleep. He could hardly wait for morning. He wanted to pick berries, fish, and go swimming all at once. Far away, he heard the sound of an owl hooting. Nearby, another owl answered. He fell asleep thinking of Luhu. In the morning, Mama, Grandma, and the children walked to the berry patch. Along the way, the children picked small but tasty Saskatoon berries. After they had filled their cups, they dumped the berries into big buckets. Help me make the berry racks, Lawrence, said Mama. Every year they used the same spruce poles to make the racks. With Mama's help, Lawrence wove willow tree branches between the poles to make a table. They laid a tarp on top of the berries out in the hot sun. Turn the berries over, Grandma told Cousin Clara. We want them to be dry by tonight. Lawrence walked back along the rolling hills to the berry bushes. Sammy shouted, I bet I can fill up my cup faster than you. The boys picked faster and faster. Lawrence remembered the good patches from the year before. Soon he had filled his cup. I win, he yelled and raced towards the buckets. In his haste, he tripped over a tree root and went flying. His berries scattered everywhere. His elbow was scraped raw. His cousins laughed at him until Mama chased them away. Then she put her arm around him. Are you all right? She asked gently, wiping his elbow with a cloth. Her smile made him feel strong again. Mama, he asked. Am I going to school soon? He really wanted to know why Mama and Grandma looked so sad and worried, but he didn't know how to ask. Now Mama frowned. Don't worry about school. Just keep picking berries and remember, slow down next time. Don't pick any more berries for the mice. Dawn touched the sky. Wisps of mist floated on the damp ground. Papa, can I go hunting with you this year? Lawrence stood as tall as possible when he asked. Papa shook his head. Not yet, my son. When we're in the bush, we spread out and walk for miles looking for game. If we're too far from camp, we stay overnight. We take only one blanket each. Your mama wouldn't like you to get cold or sick. Lawrence looked at the ground to hide his disappointment. While we're away, why don't you test your skills? Said Papa. There's a family of beavers living in the river. They come up for food very early in the morning and late in the evening. If they smell you, they will dive down and go somewhere else. See if you can fool them. I can fool them, fool them, Papa. Don't be so sure until you try. Papa and Uncle Lewis and Uncle James picked up their, back, their pack sacks, waved goodbye, and disappeared down the trail. Grandma, Grandpa told Lawrence, to see a beaver, you must find a bushy spot near the river. You must have a clear view of where the water is dark and deep. Look carefully for a nose above the water. That is how beavers check for danger. In the late afternoon, Lawrence walked to the beaver down. He chose a spot that looked right and sat and waited. He heard the buzz of a horse fly and shuddered to think of its painful bite. Suddenly, he remembered his grandma's trick. With his pocket knife, he cut a willow branch to use as a fly swatter. The beavers would think it was the wind blowing. As he waited, he thought of mama's delicious rabbit stew cooking on the campfire for supper. His stomach grumbled with hunger. His mouth was dry and he got drier as he watched the river. Now he understood what the hunters meant when they talked about patience and discipline. It would be easy to go back to camp, eat supper and go to bed, but he had to stay to prove himself to his father. A speck of dark appeared on the silvery water. Ripples followed behind it. Lawrence's heart beat faster. Would the beaver smell him or see him? A long time seemed to pass, he sat motionless. Then the beaver swam to the opposite side of the river, unaware of the boy nearby. Lawrence had fooled the beaver. Chapter three, Grizzly. Lawrence was almost as tall as his grandma. Sometimes he wondered exactly how tall she really was. She always seemed to be bending down, reaching for her sewing or putting a log on the fire. Her best friend was Whiskers, her dog. He was a rusty brown color. Many long hairs grew on each side of his nose. 
When he was a puppy, Grandma wanted to call him Wapoose, which meant rabbit, but she chose Whiskers instead. Wherever Grandma went, Whiskers was not far behind. Grandma knew just about everything when she was young. She had been a bronco buster and had ridden horses every day. She could hunt and fish better than any than most. Your cuckoo is equal to anyone, Papa once told Lawrence. You will learn a lot from her if you watch and listen. Listening to Grandma was fun. She talked to the birds, scolding them if they were too noisy. She, if she heard the owl, oops, sorry, the howl of a coyote or a wolf, she wondered out loud if it was hungry or lonely. At night, she told funny stories until the children fell asleep. Today, we have to walk a long way, Grandma told Lawrence one morning. The special medicines I want to pick are on the other side of that big hill. Make sure you pack enough lunch so we don't get hungry. Lawrence took a gunny sack and packed their lunch. He slung it over his shoulder. I'm a real hunter now, he pretended. I'll bring home lots of food to feed everybody for lots of days. Grandma turned and looked back at him. Hurry up, Lawrence. Quit your daydreaming. You're lagging behind. Under her arm, Grandma carried her small single shot 22 rifle. It was so old that it was held together by a bit of wire. Her eyesight was dimming, but she could still bring home a rabbit or a cartridge for supper. My rifle is as old as I am, but that doesn't matter. It has kept me in food and clothing for many years. That is all that counts, she said. Some medicines grew in swampy areas. Others, like sage, grew in dry areas. You will find Labrador bushes in the muskeg, Grandma told Lawrence as they walked. We make tea with the leaves. It helps us feel better when we are tired or feeling sick. By the shore of the little lake, she used her knife to cut the roots of a plant. From her pouch, she took a pinch of tobacco. This is how we give thanks to our Mother Earth, she said. She put the tobacco in the ground where the root had been. Grandma held up a chunk of root. When it is dry, this rat root is good for a sore throat or cold. Chew a small piece or make a tea with it. I always carry rat root wherever I go. She knew her grandson was tired, yet he didn't complain. She pointed to a clear stream that gurgled on its way to the river. Here is a good spot for a cup of tea and some bannock. Soon her fire burned brightly and the water in her teapot bubbled. She threw a handful of mint leaves into the pot. Whiskers eyed the bannock hungrily. You should be hunting your own food, Grandma told him. Whiskers wagged his tail. Grandma chuckled. Take this piece of bannock, you lazy dog, but I expect you to keep your eye out for bears. Where is Whiskers? As Lawrence poured water over the fire, Grandma grumbled out loud. It's not like that silly dog to run off. He's usually afraid of his own shadow. She pointed up the trail. The medicine I want grows just over that hill. Carrying her pack sack, she set off quickly with Lawrence following right behind. Their willow branch fly swatters made the only sound in the forest. Grandma slowed down. Something's not right here, she said. All the birds are quiet. Lawrence looked around. The forest was still. Even the leaves seemed to have stopped rustling. Suddenly, he felt afraid. Grandma stopped walking. Stay behind me, Lawrence. Don't make any noise and keep a sharp lookout, she ordered. Lawrence's thoughts went raced wildly. He knew wild animals could be dangerous. What if it was a moose with big antlers? What would he do? What if it was a cougar hiding in the trees? He crept close to Grandma. Her eyes searched the tall grasses and willow bushes ahead, watching for movement. Without warning, a giant grizzly reared up before them on the trail. Lawrence had never seen anything that big. The bear was as tall as their house. The grizzly towered over them, grunting and snorting. His huge front paws were raised high. Lawrence knew from the elders that this was a bad sign. Bears were most dangerous when they stood up, especially grizzly bears. The elders also said that to run from a grizzly was certain death. Instantly, Grandma threw her pack sack in front of the grizzly. For a moment, the bear hesitated, curious at what he had found. Grandma hissed, whatever you do, Lawrence, don't move. Ever so slowly, she raised her little rifle with its single bullet. She stared straight at the powerful bear. She knew she would have only one chance to re she would not have a chance to reload. Then she shot. In slow motion, the grizzly began to fall toward them. Grandma jumped back, bumping into Lawrence as the giant bear toppled forward, crashing at their feet. A cloud of dust rose around them. Almost not daring to breathe, they stared at the mountain of brown fur. 
Even lying down, it was as tall as Lawrence. The bear's claws were longer than Papa's fingers. Were they really safe? Or would the bear jump up and chase them? If he moves, run and climb a tree as fast as you can, whispered Grandma. I'm not leaving you, Cookum. Don't worry, I'll be right behind you. After a long time, Grandma sat down beside the bear. Thank you for giving up your spirit and not killing us, she said. Thank you, grizzly bear, Lawrence repeated. This grizzly was the king of the area for a long time, said Grandma. He is the biggest grizzly I've ever seen, she gave Lawrence a hug. They hurried back to camp on the way Whiskers came slinking out of the bush. Come here, you scared rabbit, Grandma scolded. I should have called you Wapoose after all. You never even barked once to warn us. Camp was abuzz with talk of the giant grizzly. While Grandma rested, Papa, Uncle Lewis, and Uncle James went into the bush with the horses to bring back the bear. When he saw it, Uncle Lewis was amazed. There are many bears in this area, but none as big as this one, he said. They cut the meat into portions and loaded it onto the horses. Back at the camp, it would be smoked and dried and shared with all of the families. Every part of the bear could be used. Bear grease was prized as a rub for people with sore bones. The claws and teeth were given as gifts of honor. The hide was made a prized rug. While everyone worked, Grandma sat calmly sipping her mug of tea under the shade of a tarp. Papa joked, Cuckoo, imagine what you could do with a slingshot. More than once, Mama hugged Lawrence. My son, she said, we will celebrate your bravery with a feast when we get home. Something like a frog jumped in Lawrence's throat. He was so happy he wanted to cry. Soon it was time to pack for home. The two families had worked hard, picking sacks of berries, smoking and drying meat for winter, and gathering large bundles of wild mint and medicine plants. For the last time, Lawrence and his cousins swam in the cool, clear river. I'm a grizzly bear, shouted Lawrence. He snorted and splashed water everywhere. The children laughed. Water car carried all the way to the camp. Chapter four, as long as the rivers flow. Lawrence ran into the shed. Uhu was not there. He ran out again, calling for Maru. Where is Uhu? He asked breathlessly. She burst into tears. He flew away. Lawrence ran to Papa. Uhu's gone, he cried. Papa was unloading the wagon. I told you that one day Uhu would leave us, he said. But don't worry, he's still too young to hunt for himself. After he practices flying some more, he'll be back for his supper. Feeling lost, Lawrence wandered down to the woods. Suddenly, a dark shape sailed silently through the air. Uhu, Lawrence hollered. The owl settled on a nearby tree. Uhu, I'm home. The owl's head swiveled right around as if, to, as if to listen better. I knocked over a giant grizzly bear bigger than the shed. You don't have to be afraid of anything when I'm around, Lawrence bragged. With a swoop, Uhu flew into the boy's arms. All day long, good smells came from the house as the family prepared for the gathering. As the guests arrived, Lawrence was surprised that he had so many aunts and uncles and cousins. Tell us about the grizzly bear, his cousins begged. Finally, the feast was ready. The table was covered with pots of moose stew and piles of fresh baked bread. Special foods like smoked fish and duck soup were cooked in honor of the elders and storytellers. Lawrence ate until he was stuffed. After supper, everyone settled comfortably outside on blankets around the fire. The storytelling began. Uncle Lewis stood up. He was tall and handsome. Everyone knew that he was the best storyteller around. Even the youngest children were quiet. Uncle Lewis stroked his bushy mustache before speaking. Once there was a man who walked in the four directions. He went north, south, east, and west. He was a brave and seeking person who went from village to village learning all there was to know. He learned about new foods and how to cook them. In the prairies, he lived in teepees. In the cold lands, he lived in igloos. He saw waves of grass where the buffalo roam. He tasted salty water where the sun rises and the sun sets. He came to dry lands where the sands were hot. Lawrence saw himself in Uncle Lewis's story, walking every step of the way. Then it, went at, it was Auntie Rosie's, Rose's turn. She told them about three hunters who surprised a grizzly bear eating their moose. The hunters climbed high to the only tree around. It wasn't very big or very strong. It started sagging until they were over the grizzly's head. The bear took a swipe at them, but the hunters were just out of reach. They hung down from that tree like berries thick on a branch. They looked tasty too. Auntie Rose turned to Uncle Dave. 
Weren't you one of those hunters, she asked. Oh, I was too skinny to tempt the bear, Uncle Dave replied, but you should have seen my cousin. He was sorry he had eaten so much. The bear was drooling at the sight of him. Everyone laughed. Grandpa rose and called Lawrence to his side. This is my grandson. Not many boys his age meet a grizzly bear or care for an owl. From now on, we will call him Osaniko. Os the name meant young man. Lawrence stood proudly beside his grandpa. The firelight flickered on grandpa's gentle face. This land has always given us what we need to live, he said gravely. Like, the, like they told us long ago, as long as the rivers flow, this land is ours. It is up to all of us to care for it. Now it's your turn, grandchildren. The future is in your hands. The stories continued long into the night. Lawrence's eyes began to droop. Soon he fell asleep listening to the familiar voices. Lawrence rose early. He wanted to walk through the bush to his favorite places. He had heard many things around the fire. Now he wanted time to remember the stories and teachings. As his hand touched the door, Mama whispered, You take care. I will, Mama, he slipped out to watch the earth wake again. Uhu hooded, hooted and followed Lawrence from a tree to tree. He's speaking especially to me, thought Lawrence. By a little lake, he saw two ducks rising swiftly from the water. He knew that soon they would fly south for the winter. At Prairie Creek, he went to a secret patch of chokecherry bushes. He picked a handful of the blackberries to eat. They were sweet and juicy now. At the, swimming, at the swimming pool, he went for a swim. When he returned home, the sun was high in the sky. Mama and Grandma sat in the kitchen. They looked up sadly as he came in. Is something wrong? Lawrence asked. I was waiting for you, my son, Mama said. Tell the children to come in. I have something to tell all of you. The children gathered around the kitchen table. Mama put fresh buns in front of them. Each child took one, then looked at her with questioning eyes. In a couple of days, they are going to come and take you to a faraway school. Maruk began to cry. I don't want to go, she said. Little brother Buddy and baby Leonard cried too. Lawrence spoke in a shaky voice. You mean we're not going to live at home anymore? Mama's eyes were shiny with tears. They told us there is nothing we can do. All the children have to go to their school or the parents will be put in prison. She tried to smile as big tears rolled down her face. The children stared at their buns. No one felt hungry anymore. Lawrence ran out of the house to the darkness of the shed. He held Uhu close. Home was the only place he knew. What would happen without Mama and Papa? What would he eat at the school? Where would he sleep? What would happen to his sister and his brothers? Who would take care of Uhu? His tears fell on the bird's feathers. The day finally arrived. After breakfast, the children dressed in their best clothes. They stood close to Mama and Grandma. Grandpa put his armor on Grandma's shoulders. A big brown truck with high sides pulled up. Two men got out. They both wore black and looked like giant crows. Hurry up, one of them said to the children loudly in English. It's time to get on the truck. The children pulled back, terrified of the strangers. Maru clung to Mama's skirt. Papa spoke to Lawrence in their own language. Be brave, Osaniko. Take care of your younger sister and brothers. The strange men lifted the crying children one by one into the truck. Papa, Papa watched his face angry, his fist clenched. As the men closed up the back of the truck, Lawrence began to cry too. The sides of the truck were high. He couldn't see his family. He couldn't see Uhu sitting in a tree. As the truck pulled away, all Lawrence could see was the sky. The end.